today. So I'm very happy that he's here to, that he agreed to, to, to put this uh, special session together and to give us his updates on, on, on the CRAM file format. Um, should I open the PowerPoint or the, uh, the PDF? PDF should probably pass back. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Mikhail, for the uh, very kind words. Um, you've got a, I've got a lot to live up to after that introduction. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, I'm going to talk today about um, CRAM. I'm going to start off really with a bit of background for, for what it is and how it looks like. Um, but the, the main meat of the talk would be the next two sections, which is lossless compression in CRAM and how we're proposing to improve on this, and our thoughts on how we can improve on lossy compression and what we can get away of discarding. So moving quickly on, so CRAM, it's, a, it's been adopted as a GA for GH standard. Um, it had quite a lot of initial uh, flurry of different versions and improved, but it's been pretty stable and static for a reasonable length of time now. And it's got multiple independent implementations in different languages. And we feel it's a reasonable trade-off. It, ha it has a certain sweet spot of speed versus size versus granularity of random access. So why are we considering even changing it, um, given it's, you know, it's been in use uh, for a reasonable length of time. And I think it's probably fair to say that most of the large-scale genome centers are now using CRAM. If you're still using BAM, please, please don't. You'll see, see why later. Um, and the main reason we're thinking about changing it is simply the data has changed. So when CRAM was originally proposed, and I should point out it was, it was the original proposal was for the EBI. I came in much later. Um, Illumina, for example, then, had 40 different discrete quality values, and they were quite hard to compress. There was, it, it was, uh, the ideas we have now with modern data, so the, the, the Illumina machines in Novaseq now produce only four quality values, and some of the things you can do, we just didn't apply back then, so they weren't done. For example, with only four quality values, you don't need to store one per byte, you can put them in two bits at a time, so we get four per byte. Maybe do run length encoding, which works very well on the Novaseq, didn't work on the old data. And we can do these simple transforms before we then do the compression. And it has a surprisingly uh, significant improvement, but it just wasn't in the old one. And I think also our goals have changed. So um, we're more willing now to consider that perhaps this one size fits all of this is cram and it's just optimized for speed versus size versus random access. Maybe there is another thing we should op be optimizing for, which is long-term archival, where we spend more CPU time in order to get smaller files that we then deposit in, in EBI. And we're also more willing to accept um, lossy compression than we used to be. It used to be a bit of a bad word. Now, now I think we, we're, we're happy. And ideally, we'd like to do this without completely reinventing the wheel in order to try and get something which is easy to adopt with the existing software that's already out there. So to really explain what I mean by this, I first of all have to show you what a CRAM file is. It's simply a series of, series of containers bookmarked either end by a header and a footer. And each of those containers has one or more slices, and each of those slices has one or more blocks. Now, you notice both the container and uh, slice have this these headers, these are just small pieces of metadata which we can use for doing um, random access and query and an introspection on the data file. And the blocks, well, that's where the bulk of the data is stored. Now, you saw the example earlier that Michael, show, uh, Michael showed of the, um, the SAM file. It had all these individual columns, read names, quality scores, flags, etc. They are sort of equivalent in CRAM to a data series. So a data series is just a type of data. And the container header is the, that that specifies which block each of those data series belongs in so that the decoder can, can work out what to do. Now, I haven't got sequences mentioned on this, this chart up here simply because there are actually are several different ways we can store sequence. If it's unaligned data, we just store the sequence as it is and let, let the, the standard compressors do their job, um, although not very well compared to Spring. Um, if it's aligned data, we actually store the delta of the sequences to, the, uh, to what we aligned it against, be it a, a reference or a de novo assembly. And that, that reference we compare against, it can either be embedded in the CRAM file, in which case it's in one of these blocks, where the, the relevant portion is put into, each, block, uh, into the, each slice, or we can have it as an external file on disk, or we can fetch that reference over the web, and we do that using the uh, GA for GH refget protocol. Now, this metadata that I mentioned earlier allows us to do random access, and that's, that's basically done on the slice level, but as we only have one slice per container in most of our files, that's the same thing. 
So that allows for samples view, for example, to be very efficient. We can also do filtering by data type. So we don't have to decompress everything. SAM tools flag stats, for example, is just giving us summary statistics on the BAM flag fields. So that's the BF data series. We don't need to decode read names. We don't need to decode quality values. Um, so that, this is a big advantage of, of CRAM over BAM is it's, it's much faster for some of the operations we can do. Now, both of these can be combined together. So we can do with uh, our sort of streaming protocol is HGS get. So when we're doing a query to HGS get, we're saying we're interested in this region and we're interested in these columns and we'll get back a well-formed CRAM file and the columns we're not interested in, we, we sort of drop them. Basically, we just replace them with null fields. Um, and this means we've got a very fast streaming protocol because we don't, we don't query all the data, we just get the bits we need. Um, and it is still a well, it's still a well-formed valid CRAM file, so actually if we save that, we have a CRAM file on disk and we only really have to one the one format, but it's, it's flexible. We can also encrypt our data. So CRAM itself does not have an encryption layer. We didn't want to create an encryption for BAM, an encryption for CRAM, an encryption for VCF. We just have this wrapper thing called crypt for gh And this is very flexible. It allows us to do random access still. We can have multiple keys. We can limit those keys to individual parts of the files. And if the archive is storing, which it should be, um, its own data in an encrypted format, when we serve it up to the users, we can just re-encrypt the header. We don't have to re-encrypt the entire file when we're serving up the encrypted data. Now, this is currently under review. Um, the spec is at the, the, if you want to review it, it's at the bottom, but this, this uh, URL will be at the end of the, the talk as well. Now, as this is a talk really about uh, data compression, I need to um, explain where that comes in. So the blocks, each block basically has a self-describing mode that says how it's been compressed. And it can either be standard things like gzip, bzip2, lzma, et cetera, or it can be some of the codecs we've written custom for CRAM. And this is where CRAM 3.1 fits in. It's new codecs that are more performant. So just, uh, we've mentioned several times in several talks about things like context modeling and mixing and so forth. So this is just a very, very quick, I don't want to label this too much, um, in explanation of what that means. So when I talk about a model, it's basically a frequency distribution of symbols in a known alphabet. Now, if we think about English text, E is very common, Q, Z are very rare, and it's been known for a long while, literally hundreds of years, in fact, that if you use a very short code for the frequent symbols and a longer code for long symbols, you can shrink your overall message. And this is the basis of Morse code, for example. So E is dot, dash, dash, dot, dash is Q. Now, we can do better than this because we don't really want a single flat distribution. We can think about context. So this is now the context modeling. If the last letter was an A, what is the distribution of the letters which follow it? Now, AE does not occur in English very much. So E has gone from being the most common letter to one of the least common. Um, this can get really extreme. After a Q, it's nearly always a U. So this is what context modeling is trying to do. It's trying to basically say, given previous knowledge, can we learn what the statistics are? And if we can learn this very accurately, we can get better compression. So how does this apply to genomic data? So this is just a chart of, it's basically a heat map of quality values. And I don't really want to get into the nitty gritty of what this means, but if you look at the top plot here, the read one, on the x-axis we've got the cycles. So this is a MySeq run. All of these for a MySeq run. Um, so going over to the right is the, the end of the run. And then we've got the qualities on the, the y-axis. And the colors here is basically the distribution you saw earlier. Now, without really explaining what all the colors mean, we can see basically the first half to two-thirds of this are fairly uniform. The, you know, the, at the start and halfway through, they look like the same distributions. But then we start to see the, the it sort of waves up and down a bit. And we're starting to get some, some variability. So we can use the previous qualities as a context for predicting what the next qualities will be. We can also see in this bottom plot, especially over on the right-hand side, that sometimes it goes up and down quite rapidly. And there are lots of individual locations which are a bit iffy. Um, so maybe the positional information is also useful. So the previous qualities and the position. And also, rather uh, grossly, we can see the top read and the bottom read. This is a read pair. Um, they have very different looking distributions. So maybe we also want to take that into account. So all of these are the things that got put into the FQZ comp program from 2011. But it's been extended a bit for CRAM 3.1. I parameterized it and made it a bit more flexible. And really the, the only, I don't want to dwell on this much, but the main thing to, uh, main message here is that 
this notion of read one, read two, I sort of call them external because they're not part of the quality stream itself. It's an external piece of information. It comes from the BAM flags. And so we copy, we, have, we produce a sort of a, a, a this extra bits into our context and we copy them into the data stream once per read. So every time we move to a new record, we reset the context and we say, this is the external piece of information you need to add to the context. And we could, the, the reason this is important, the decoder does not know I'm doing read one, read two separation. It just knows I have this external number. And we could, at a later stage, maybe we decide, oh, actually, I've discovered this flow cell has got a bubble on it. And I need, to do, I need to split apart my distribution to things inside the bubble, things outside the bubble. Um, so we can just look at the read name information to get that. But that's an encoder smart, and the decoder doesn't need to know, which means we're sort of future-proofing ourselves. We can, as we find new ways of segregating our data up, we can still describe them in this format and we haven't got to change it. Read name compression is something else which is also really important. It turns out gzip, bzip2, etc. they're really bad at compressing read names. Um, the easy thing to do is just tokenize them. So naively here you could say we'll separate them on colons or something. Um, and just compare those tokens to another read name uh, and see how they differ. Do they match? Are they numeric? If they are numeric, is it, uh, is it a completely different number or is it the same number before but plus five or something? And so we can tokenize it. We can use a series of token streams and serialize all those together and compress it. And it turns out, although really simple, this is really, really incredible compression and it matches some of the best known sort of neural network-based compressors that take two or three orders of magnitude longer. And it's often half, half or a third the size of gzip. Um, and this has been adopted by MPEG-G as well. So how does this work? Um, what it look like? So this plot, just to explain it a bit, um, so each of the different colors is uh, a different version of CRAM. So CRAM 3.0 is the current one everyone will really be using, and 3.1 is my proposal. And I have two marks on each of these lines. So that's the normal, basically the standard version of CRAM, which is this, this sweet trade-off between size versus random access, et cetera. And the other point is, what happens if we spend more CPU time and go to archive mode? And you can see that really there wasn't much difference between archive mode and normal mode for the, the previous version of CRAM. We save a little bit of space, but we've had a lot more CPU time. Um, I should point out this, this x-axis is the size, but notice on the left it doesn't start at zero and it doesn't end at the right point. In fact, you can see here I've marked BAM. Uh, the reason it doesn't end at the right point is BAM is somewhere over by that wall. Um, so you know, it would squash the plot too much. So, so when you're doing comparisons, just remember this is sort of zoomed into the bit which is relevant. And actually, although it looks significant, the difference between CRAM 3.1 and 3.0 for this data set on the normal mode was only actually 4% saving. Um, when we use the slower modes, like this FQZ comp idea, actually it's an enormous saving we get on the, uh, the archive mode. And it's about overall a third less. Now this was with old Illumina data with the 40 quality values. What's it look like on NovaSeq? Um, it's a similar pattern, but it's a little bit different now. So even the normal mode of CRAM is 16% smaller than the normal mode of the previous CRAM. And that's entirely due to the thing I mentioned at the start, sort of bit packing and run length encoding and these simple transforms on the data, which didn't apply previously. Of course, FQZ, FQZ comp still improves things further, and we can get to overall about 22% smaller than the current normal if we do this, or 17% smaller than the previous archive. And again, see where BAM is. It's at 70 gig. So this basically, it's literally three times larger than the CRAM file. Um, we did some stats and we worked out that if you're storing your BAMs in AWS, one day of storage cost saving by converting it to CRAM offsets the money you spent in AWS to do the CPU to do the conversion. Literally just one day. Um, so you should not be storing your data in BAMs, especially not if you're paying for your, your disk space. Now that's lossless. If we think about lossy compression, so um, a very naive way of thinking about this, a simple Ford experiment, is what if, we, what if we'd had our CRAM file and we ran it through our favorite call-in pipeline, say GATK best practices, we get a BCF file out at the end. Now if, now if we went back to the CRAM, we throw all the qualities away and we replace them with something constant, say Q30, and we run it through the same pipeline, we now have two VCF files with and without qualities, and we can compare them. Where they match, so the same call with the same, roughly speaking, the same degree of accuracy, or neither of them give a call, they're both confident there's nothing there, we know qualities did not help us in making that call. 
so we can discard them. Everywhere else, we can keep them. So this is a thought experiment, tells us how we can discard qualities. Now, unfortunately, it's really expensive. We don't want to run through our variant calling pipelines twice, um, but we have a proxy for doing this. Now, I should note this big assumption at the bottom, this proxy is assuming a single diploid genome, so just bear that in mind. It's not ideal for somatic data. But basically, we use a consensus algorithm that actually I had in my previous work from GAT5, and what this is showing here, so at the top is, um, the top line here, is basically the consensus. It's not the reference, it's the consensus of all this data. And underneath it, we have all the reads. And blue here is marking where there is a uh, discrepancy to those reads. Now we can see down here where it marks deletion. So this here is a homozygous deletion in our sample, but actually we have some differences to blue up there. And that's simply, uh, that's the effect of alignment, of reference bias to the, the, in the aligner. Um, but it makes, it makes GAT5 think that, well, okay, actually, or crumble the program doing this. It thinks, I'm not so sure on the quality, so I maybe need to keep those. Now, if we discard all the bases which are different and just look at the ones which are, um, sorry, discard bases which match and we look at the differences, then the grayscales here are showing you the quality values. So we see we've got high discrepancy in this A, we've got high discrepancy at TC het. Everything else is pretty much low quality smattering of errors. And after crumble, what we get is this. So we've kept the column where we really weren't sure, this, um, this reference bias issue. And we've also kept all the bases around it, their, their confidence as well, because it's a homopolymer. And actually, the, the variant callers have been doing local realignment. So they need all the qualities in this entire region, not just the base we had. Um, everywhere else, we have one or two qualities. If it matches the consensus model, we keep them. And that's the model, even when it's a TC het, the consensus is, I'm very sure this is a TC het. So we keep both the Ts and the Cs. Everywhere else, we've decreased the qualities. We're absolutely confident they are errors. Now, that's crumbled as it currently stands, and this is how the rest of the talk is anal analyzing it. But actually, the next step is that, which is, well, maybe we should just do error correction and discard these. Um, I think, actually, this is. Uh, People aren't quite so sure on whether this is fit. It feels a bit wrong. We're editing the sequence. But actually, maybe you know, we're willing to do it on other technologies. Maybe we should consider this. But I'm not doing that at the moment. Um, so far size is where it's kind of obvious it's going to be a significant reduction. We've got whole genome shotgun. We've got exome data. It's a reasonable reduction in all of them. It reduces BAM as well as CRAM size um, because we're just reducing the data. So it doesn't matter what format it is. And it will also reduce the size of MPEG-G. Um, and also it worked even at 15x coverage, which is kind of surprising. I didn't expect it to be so confident on being able to reduce the qualities, but it still worked. Now, remember I said we're using the, the consensus as a proxy for rerunning all the variants twice. So how well does this proxy work? Is it a valid assumption? So the plot over here on the left is basically just your true positive versus the false positive. Um, where we want to be is in the top left-hand corner. So we've found every single variant, and we've made no, no errors. We had no extra ones which are incorrect. SNPs are pretty close to that. Great. We're really good at calling SNPs. Indels, well, they're reasonable. They're harder to do. Let's face it, Indels are tricky. Um, but the interesting thing about this plot is I'm superimposed both the original and the lossy version with Crumble. And it's kind of hard to see how they differ, which is great. That's what we want to see is that we do not actually harm our analysis by, by removing most of the quality values. More interesting is if we zoom up on those two areas, um, the SNPs, actually we've got closer. So the green lines here are, are the crumbled output. We're closer to this top left-hand corner, which is the ideal position. So as we saw with, uh, with um, was it Quartz or Cupid's head earlier, actually it improved the quality. It's kind of bizarre. None of us really know why this happens. It even happens on Indels. And this even happens at 15x coverage, although not so much for indels. It's pretty much 50-50. But at SNPs, we're still, still improving. It's kind of one of the unknowns we don't understand. Now, it wasn't just me who did the analysis. So DNA Nexus independently did a, uh, an evaluation of Crumble. And again, they found a similar file size. They were a bit more um, uh, sensible in testing more data sets. They looked at uh, NovaSeqs. And NovaSeq, there's less of a reduction, but that's because the quality is actually don't, they don't make up as a larger chunk of the files so as expected. They also did a far better job than I did, I have to admit, in analyzing the, the effect. They found that it, um, it didn't 
well, it didn't really harm anything, and in fact, it improved the results not only on GATK, but also Freebase and on Google Deep Variant, which is kind of bizarre, but at least it's been val validated by someone else. So that's qualities. What have we got left? Um, actually, the, other, the next biggest thing, typically in our file, is read names. And we don't really need the read names. Once we've done our alignments, and once we've done our QC, and importantly, once we've done marking for optical duplicates, which does use the read names, we no longer need them. If we have a read pair in the same cram slice, we can discard them, because we already have that linkage. We just need to know they link together. It doesn't matter what they're called. And also, the aligners, we all know the aligners love to produce a, a long list of auxiliary tags, you know, as long as your arm. Um, I'm sure it makes the authors really happy, but most people don't actually use those auxiliary tags. There's a few which are relevant and, and many which aren't. So we can give it a, a blacklist and a whitelist as what ones we want to keep. Now, the data I did the analysis on was the Syndip data set from the Broad. And if you haven't seen this as a truth set, it's thoroughly worth recommending. I'm not going to get into it here, but it was really, really important for doing the analysis. Um, now, a, a breakdown on the compressed file. So red here is... Um, this is just one chromosome, but red is the quality values. Uh, in this case, actually, the, the read names weren't the next biggest. The auxiliary tags were. Um, and then the sequences are yellow. So you see sequence is actually one of the smaller chunks of data, or even though it's the most important. But um, this file had happened to have been through the GATK BQSR, this base quality recalibration scheme. And uh, this isn't part of the standard best practices anymore, but at the time, um, the original qualities got punted over to an auxiliary tag. So not only did we have qualities in the quality field, we had another copy of the qualities in it somewhere else, which is completely mental. But there we are. Um, so what we did is we ran Crumble and we told it to remove the OQ tag as well as removing the qualities. And what we got left is this, so at the, the bottom. So you see this little sliver over here, that's how much we got left of the qualities. So we got rid of nearly all of them. There's a tiny little sliver of renames in this particular bizarre case, there's a tiny little sliver of your auxiliary tags. And we've now got to under one gig for um, this entire chromosome. And I, I think roughly the entire 50x human would be around about 10 gig. So this is, uh, it's, a, it's a, pretty, a pretty substantial reduction, bearing in mind we're still able to call variants with the same degree of accuracy. Finally, I mentioned earlier about Crumble, that about possibly we need to go one step further than just adjusting quality values. So if we remove the bases we know are incorrect, um, or at least we're confident, and I say confident, I haven't actually tested this yet, so I haven't done the evaluation. This is last minute uh, uh, experimentation. We save about another 20%. Now, Cram, this was with Cram uh, 3.0 actually, or actually 3.1 arc as well. And you can see it actually, the difference now between 3.0 and 3.1 is not so significant, but that's because we've got actually uh, most of the quality values and the read names are now gone, which is where most of my gain was. But it is still a, a small gain. So finally, some acknowledgements. As I mentioned earlier, um, CRAM wasn't my idea. It came from the EBI. Um, Vadim was the, the main person who did the original implementation in Java, and it's on his work that I basically stand and have been improved. Um, and also various other uh, people from Sango, where you can read this as much as I can. Um, and there's a bunch of links for uh, the various things. I should point out, HGS Codex is basically where my new compression codecs are. So there's a standalone library, and you can look at them and see whether they're, they're useful for any other file format. Some of them may well be. And again, that uh, PDF, for, if you want to review the GA for GH, Crypt for GH is there. Thank you for listening. for the very nice update on, on the CRAM format. Uh, so regarding Crumble, which I'm very happy to see that, uh, I mean, I, as I mentioned before, I still remember like when you just mentioned lossy, people were like, no. So that, you know, it started to, to pick up. Uh, so the analysis that you've shown is on the high seek data or on the Nova seek data? So the I, Crumble, so, uh, I did my analysis on Syndip. The main problem I had was knowing I need, in order to evaluate what the effect is, you need to have a truth set. Yes. And actually, um, 
Syndip was the truth set I used because it was so much better at picking up the nasty problems. The problem, I mean, the, the problem is it's very easy to call easy variants, and it's really hard to yes. call the nasty ones. And if we're doing lossy compression, it's the nasty stuff we really need to look at. Have we lost our ability to call variants accurately in those nasty regions? And it turns out the pattern of genomes and genome in a bottle, they're good, but actually it's those nasty regions is the bits they filter out. Okay. And Syndip filtered out far less of those, to the extent where the variant callers produce 10 times error rate in those regions and they do the bits elsewhere. Um, so that's why I use, use crumbled air. But unfortunately, it was old data. Yes. Okay. Um, now, I'm pleased to see that DNA Nexus evaluated it, and they did their own data sets. I don't know which things they, they ran it on, but they had NovaSeq listed in their chart, so I'm assuming they also evaluated accuracy on NovaSeq. Okay, no, I am curious to see because, like, at the beginning we started with lossy compression on the QVs because of the large alphabet, but uh, I think Shubham saw the, like, even when you reduce it to four values, it's still a big chunk, so it still makes sense yeah. to do lossy. Some people are like, oh, we're already at four, we maybe not, don't need lossy, and you just saw that we really need lossy. I was just curious to see if there is a, difference in gain between the 42 lossy when you apply to crumble or so the... this this particularly no okay so you can see that the, it has reduced the size crumble has certainly had an effect but it's probably yeah but it's that? similar to I, the gain is maybe, not as the gain is not as much as okay. you would expect because okay. the size of the quality yes, values is yes. a much okay. smaller portion of the file but okay. it's still beneficial okay yeah yeah of course okay okay thank you Any other questions? <laughs> We're all waiting. <laughs> okay, so um, I will. Uh